to explore initially the question of the self, each uh, of the panellists is going to respond to the question, who looks back in the mirror? And they each have four minutes. And I think, Barry, you're going to set the ball rolling. That's it. Whatever the self is or isn't, we all have, each one of us, a very strong sense of ourselves. So you have a sense of the self, a sense of who you are, a sense of what you are that's given to you in a very fundamental way. And that sense of self is uh, with you, it seems, all the time. Because you've got the sense of self, it's very easy to suppose that that is an identifier of a single thing, a continuity, the thing that you think about when you remember and, and the person that's involved in planning the future. You tend to think of the self as somehow supported by maybe some single part of you, some single uh, aspect of you. And I want to tell you that that's just not the case. The sense of self, which we have and which is so strong, is actually constituted and created by a number of very, very different mechanisms, very, very different things going on in us. So when philosophers talk about the self, they often resort to purely mental characteristics. They talk about memory. They talk about the idea that they are intending or using their free will to do something. But actually, the body is enormously involved in our sense of self. The body has a strong constitutional part to play in your idea of being you. And the body and the sense of bodily awareness you have breaks down into a number of different stages or a number of different uh, aspects. You have a sense of agency in acting, a sense that when you're doing something, it's you who's pulling the levers, making the limbs work. So you've got a sense of agency, but you've also got a sense of ownership where you think these are my limbs, my hands, my feet, and so on. Now, some of, these, uh, some of these very fundamental senses that kind of locate you can break down. We know from brain damaged patients, people with parietal lesions, people with damage to um, uh, the, usually the right hemisphere, they can end up losing some of these uh, vital aspects of the sense of self. So for example, if you lose your sense of ownership, you can have people who feel their hand, but they don't think it's their hand. If you ask them whose hand is it, some of these patients will say, it's the doctor's hand, or it's the hand of a person they know very well, or it's the hand of a loved one. So just actually getting feelings and sensations from your arm is not enough for you to think it's mine. So the sense of ownership requires you to lay claim to these limbs. And we forget that that must be present to make things work the way they seem to do normally and in a familiar way. Sense of ownership too, when people lose the sense of uh, not ownership but agency, they sometimes can be in the horrible position where they feel that the hand moves. It reaches out for a cup and starts drinking and they say, I didn't do that, the hand did it. Now we've got very specific explanations. We can go into that in the question time as to why that happens. But just realize that you need the cooperation of a number of different systems to work smoothly, in concert, to give you that sense of here I am, in charge of my body, moving around the world. So that sense of self that comes from bodily awareness is, is, is driven by certain neural mechanisms, and if they break down, so does the sense of self break down. Another notion of self that we like is the one that's the more narrative notion of the self, where you think about your past and your experience. I mean, that, that narrative notion actually is the one that allows us to think that the self is actually quite changing, not so constant, not so stable. I think to myself, where is that very confident guy who only a year ago seemed so sure of what he was doing, who seemed so, so positive, had such a good outlook? Where's he gone? Why is it now it feels so different? But we narrate our experience and we try to put it into some sequence and order. And we use language to do that. And the language we use is actually quite important as the sort of fabric of the mind, the glue that stitches things together. Now, you don't get language until you're about two, two and a half years old. You acquire language at about the age of two and a half when you can finally master sentences. It may be the absence of language before that that explains infant amnesia. Why is it none of you can remember 
what happened between zero and two. Very important time, a lot going on, but you don't have command of it. So the sense of a self seemed to be much easier to get hold of in retrospect only after that time, and that's the time when language comes in. So this is also a bit of the glue, it seems, of making the self. Now, I think before that, I think before the age of two and a half and before the age of about four, usually you don't get a sense of self until you have a sense of others distinct from you. And that full idea that there are other self-motivating independent creatures with beliefs and minds that are different from yours, that's really consolidated about the age of four when you pass the so-called false belief test, when you can ascribe to other people false beliefs, beliefs that are not your belief. Now, that's when you start to have a sense of self. Now, notice how many building blocks and building bricks are in there just to make up the self. And any of them could break down and you could lose this. So the notion of self and the sense of self is fragile. It's extremely fragile. And before the self emerges, I want to say there's something that goes on which is social. There's a kind of social interaction, and a lot of people are working on social cognition, where at a very early age you are influenced by other people. You're responsive to other people, to their eye movements, to their interest in you, and so on. So it might be that there's a very primitive notion of something social, a kind of intersubjectivity, which is before the notion of self and other, and out of which the notion of self and other grow. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Right. Right over to the other side, to you, Simon. Um, well, uh, I would say that, um, this, that we cannot do without... Is this microphone working? No. Well, I'll just speak a bit louder. We, we, we cannot do without the sense of self because... Firstly, because we're ethical creatures. So I would start from that point of view. And secondly, because we're powerless creatures and, to some degree, powerful creatures as well. And both the ethical and the sense of powerlessness, perhaps alluding to what Barry just said about development, pre presuppose, as well as foster, a sense that there is something that continues through time and that has borders. It would be meaningless to say that I hold to values or that I have ends in mind for my life without a very robust sense that there is a continuant of some kind that is the owner, the subject, the agent of those values, of those projects, of those commitments that I, ha that, that I have in my life. And so it seems to me we can't do without a sense of self. Now what the components are of that sense of self, the extent to which it's body, memory, consciousness, uh, narrative, which has become very trendy in the last 150 years, um, is, I, th I think Barry, I agree with everything that Barry just said on that. But I start, as I say, from the point of view of the ethical and the bordered. Now, the ethical, both those elements are highly social. We think, at least in an age of autonomy in the last, let's say, over the last 200 years, that we invent our values. People say, you know, I have my values and they're self-legislated and so on. The reality is that almost none of us invent our values. We are social creatures. We get most of what we think, which is why there's this always this striking consensus on, 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 on the basics, for example, of morality across millions of people from the society in which we live. So to, to, to that extent, to the, to the extent I'm an ethical self, myself is to a very great degree socially constituted. As far as borders are concerned, the, the, the idea of the self is required because of this borderedness we have. There's the developmental story to which Barry just alluded where the borders, the sense, the, the primitive sense of self in the infant comes above all from his sense of, or her sense of powerlessness, from the idea of losing or being vulnerable to losing the uh, protective figure and in the end figures, m the mother, the father, the extended family, and then as you go through life, all those on whom you depend, people who give you jobs, etc your spouses, your, you know, etc. This sense of vulnerability is tremendously powerful in developing a sense of self. So, as I say, I start from both the ethical and the vulnerability of human beings, and I see selfhood as crucial to understanding those. Thank you very much. Henrietta. Well, 
Well, I'm not, perhaps we're going to get an unwarranted degree of consensus, perhaps until Julian comes into the conversation. Um, I think all selves are socially constructed. They have to be. You can't have a sense of self uh, unless you develop it in relation to others. You can only have a sense of self if you have a sense that others are different from you. But the question comes, what role does language play in all of this, and then what role does culture play? Um, what do we really mean when we talk about the person, the self, and the individual? Are those things actually to be distinguished easily one from the other? Now, there's a great deal of philosophical discussion about this, a, a very Western set of preoccupations, perhaps. But the, um, if one of the issues is how do we internalize, exactly as Simon said, the, the things that culture gives to us. We know that, that culture doesn't simply impose thing, things on us from outside, but that they grow up in us because we interact with a world of objects. Some of those objects are physical, some of them are human. And it's through that kind of interaction that we begin to develop an idea that we can act on the world, that we have a relation to the world, that we have borders or boundaries to ourselves. But when we look at those questions across other cultures and ask, is it true that other cultures always think that the person is bounded by the physical body? The answer is no. There are plenty of cultures, for example, who think that aspects of the human are to be found in, in say, aspects of the landscape. Lots of people in other parts of the world believe that mountains are sentient beings. Now, what does that say about the boundaries of the human and the boundaries of the self? And humans very often think of themselves as being made up of aspects of the natural world. The powers and abilities of the natural world are also things that can become part of human agency. So the question of deciding, is myself something that's always interior to me? Is the, is the self of others something that's always interior to them? Is actually not easy to establish in a, in a cross-cultural situation. But if we agree that language is important, then we have to ask ourselves, what are the boundaries of language? Does it matter, for example, that we, at different moments in different places and, and in different historical periods, think about the self differently? Is the way we think about the self actually changing the character of the self? Or are there aspects of that self that are always going to be the same everywhere, regardless of cultural context? So this is a question about, are there some things that are universal? are there some things that are always going to be different and quite a number of thinkers take the view that one of the characteristics of humans is that they are everywhere the same and everywhere different and that this can be the case not only across cultures and across historical periods but also within a single culture that in fact there are many things that all of us in this room share in terms of our understanding of self but there are many many ways in which we differ in how we think about ourselves. We're all actually distinctive because of the way we've interacted with an environment. Now that interaction is of course mental, it's cognitive, but it's also physical. So that we know that the hands of a farmer are not the same as the hands of a seamstress. That there are different ways in which we are marked by the environments we engage with. And that happens <coughs> both cognitively and physically. And there's no way really of deciding is that is the somatic to be separate from the cognitive. Those two things go together. And we have, if we think about the last 200 years, just in the United Kingdom, changed enormously. In the, in the 1900s, many of us either worked on farms or worked in factories. Now very, very few of us do. And we consequently think of ourselves in very different ways. We believe that we're different kinds of people. So that we now talk about, I can choose to be who I am in the past. Nobody chose to be who they were in that sense. That degree of determination over self is something that is, is, is growing and changing over time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Julia. Well, I say there's a lot to, uh, to agree about, but I think that with this issue, like so many, uh, the disagreements are really about emphasis. And I think that um, sometimes people tend to overstate the bit of the puzzle they're interested in. So although I'd agree about social construction, I agree about body, um, I think they're dangerous perhaps in conversation we're coming to about overstating that because I think ultimately it does come back to the psychological unity which is really where sense of self is I mean that is the, the, it depends upon body it depends upon social institutions to a great degree but it, it what they're all shaping is something which is psychological now picking up what Barry said um, the fact is the view that a lot of people have come to and it comes to from traditions of Buddhism, of Western philosophy and also modern neuroscience is sometimes called this bundle view. The idea that there is no core pearl 
essence of self, an unchanging heart of you which remains the same. And that rather, whatever the self is, it's a creation of the interaction of different things, including environment, body, all the different things in your mind. And, you know, let's just assert that for the moment as something that is the view I endorse. But I think there are important things to say about this because I think that sometimes people get carried away with the idea. The first thing is that although it doesn't seem to be the intuitive idea most people have of themselves, that although most people intuitively feel that there is some core of being which is them, I don't think you should take much reflection to conclude that we really shouldn't be so surprised that this is what it turns out that people are because isn't everything like that apart from maybe fundamental particles let's take a simple thing like a, a water molecule now you know you do not think that water is a thing which has attached to it two parts hydrogen and one parts oxygen we all accept the fact that water molecule is simply those molecules suitably arranged and bound you have a mobile phone or a computer you understand full well that there is not a computer which has all its numerous parts that's a manner of speaking rather you put all the parts together in the right way and you create a computer now there's no deep metaphysical mystery there is no uh, enduring core or pearl of essence of you know iphone there's no philosophical mystery that there's no core or essence or enduring pearl at the heart of water. We have no problem thinking that these things are the collections of their parts. And so in a way, I don't think it should be surprising that, that we recognise that we too are that kind of thing. We too are, are basically an, a very highly ordered collection of parts. But as Barry said, one that can actually disintegrate quite uh, disturbingly readily in the wrong kind of circumstances, certain brain traumas or psychological traumas. So that shouldn't be too surprising. And so therefore I think that when people take that view, a lot of the time the summary people give of it is that if we accept this bundled view, and it's really a family of views rather than a single view actually, and yeah, there are lots of views which are broadly bundle-like. If we accept this then we conclude the self is an illusion. Now in some ways this word illusion is harmless. Um, if you understand it very, very precisely, meaning it's not quite as it seems to be. Well, not as it seems to be. If you, there, the illusion, such as there is an illusion about the self, is that there is this permanent core, this essence which is unchanging. That's an illusion. But it doesn't mean the self is an illusion. The fact that you accept the self is this collection, this bundle, doesn't make it any less real. And I think this is the most important thing to, to state because it, it's not unusual to find people proponing this uh, uh, bundled view in various forms and again with a lot of neuroscience going on now and a lot of real empirical research giving all sorts of evidence to show that bits of you are, are doing things other bits are not aware of and so forth again it's very tempting a lot of writers people like Thomas Metzinger who wrote a book called The Ego Tunnel and David Eagleman in his recent book you know they talk about the self being an illusion and I think it's very important to recognize that the fact that we are this bundle this collection we have no essence doesn't mean we're not real and so that's the, the major sort of corrective I want to sort of like put into to this debate and similarly I think in lots of other respects you'll find that's the particular bit of the understanding of the self that I would think of I think we have to be very careful when we talk about any contribution to sense of self that we don't get carried away and make too much of it thank you